to our morning service today. If I sound a bit croaky, it's because I've picked up a nasty cold. Uh, I think I'll be all right. I hope so, because I'm taking another service this afternoon. Um, it's important that we are also, perhaps at the beginning of our time together, uh, remember the folks that can't be with us today. Uh, Judy and Andrew are not well. Judy got a very bad cold. And um, poor Marion found it almost impossible to get out of bed um, this morning because of her bad arthritis, you know, she suffers from this. Uh, and, of course, uh, Mike and Betty, although Becky's now home from the hospital, she's not quite fit enough to, to come and join us. But they'll be with us in their prayers. Let's begin with a hymn. All our hymns are connected today uh, with what the Lord Jesus has done for us on the cross. And we're going to start with hymn 245 if you're using the hymn book, as some of you are, I can see. Um, and it's the hymn, I Stand Amazed at the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Let's join in to sing this lovely hymn. Question. 
then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say, from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say, from men, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Then he began to speak to the, them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place and wine, uh, for a vine bat, bat, and built a tower, and he leased it to the vine dressers and went into the far country. Now at the vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away again, if, uh, away empty handed. Again he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent them, him to them uh, last, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir, heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. They took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him but feared for the, the multitude, for they, uh, for they knew he had spoken a parable against them. So they left him and went away. Thank you, it's quite some time now since we've been in Mark's Gospel. We rested from that leading up to Christmas. And um, we're now coming back to where we reached the last thing we talked about was how Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. But we're going to move on from that today. Just the events of what we now know as the Tuesday of what's called Holy Week. You think? Sunday was Palm Sunday. Monday was the day he overturned the temple tables. And Tuesday is where we are looking at today. There are two things that we're looking at today. The first is the question about authority and then the parable that Jesus told. You'll remember the uproar, an uproar there was when Jesus took a whip and removed the money changers, the traders in the temple, because the temple was meant to be a place where people could worship God. In fact, that part of the temple was the only place non-Jews could worship. But unsurprisingly, as soon as Jesus went back to the temple, after that Monday on the Tuesday morning, he was accosted by a group of people. Chief priests, Teachers of the law and elders, they were waiting for him. And they had thought out, very carefully, a question to ask him. This was the question. Who gave you this authority? In other words, the authority to come in and clear the temple of the traders and so on. And teach him even. 
So they asked this question, by what authority are you doing these things? Cleansing the temple? Teaching here? Who gave you this authority? After all, they were the leaders, the priests in the temple. It seems likely that they thought this would catch him out. However, he answered it. There seemed to be two answers he could have given. He could have said, well, God gave me the authority. But as soon as he said something like that, they would have challenged him. How can a Galilean carpenter know more of the will of God than the chief priests? But if he said, no one gave me authority, I just did it. The crowd who supported Jesus would have been disappointed and might have stopped their support. Jesus was not just a Galilean carpenter. He knew the scriptures. He knew a lot more than they realised he did. They realised, whichever he realised, whichever answer he gave, he was trapped. That was the purpose of that. Catch Christian, wasn't it? <coughs> so he turned the debate to them with a question. Now they were so confident in themselves, they could never have thought he could ask them a question that they could not or would not be able to answer without incriminating themselves. Did you notice when Penny read this? I will ask you one question. Answer me. And I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. <coughs> John's baptism. Or the work of John the Baptist, in other words. Was it from heaven? Was it God-given? Or was it of human origin? Tell me. And then I will answer your question. <coughs> so they got together with the huddle. And they realised that they were in a trap. Well... We can't really say the work of John was from heaven, a work of God, as he would immediately say to us, well then why didn't you believe him and follow him? Because they didn't. In fact, John called them a brood of vipers on one occasion, these Pharisees and these religious leaders. Why did you not believe him? Ah. But if we say, no, he didn't get God's authority. He came from men. He was just a man. The people will turn against us. As they all believed that John was a prophet. In fact, one of the greatest of the prophets. So, the reply from the intelligent rabbis and priests and leaders was this. Simply, we don't know. In other words, they were refusing to answer. So what did Jesus say back to them? Well, neither then will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. With all their intellect and education, they could not answer the carpenter from Nazareth. Now the root of their trouble, these people, was not in their intellect. They were learned people, but in their stubborn wills. We're going to look at another week, three other carefully thought about trap questions. But that's for another time. But you know, there are many people in our world today who may be very clever, very intellectual, but are stubborn in their unbelief. Because I think many of them know deep down, if they admit that God exists, then he will have a claim on their lives. They want to be in control and live as they want. And I wonder, if we sometimes are stubborn, wanting to live as we want, to go our own way, instead of God's. That's an important question, is it? Do we want our own way, or are we wanting to follow the way of God. Does he really 
have first place as Lord over your life and over my life. That was the beginning of the day on Tuesday. Then Jesus turns and tells them a remarkable parable. This was the last long parable Jesus told before his death. As you know, he's told many parables. But most of Jesus' parables had one main meaning. A parable is a story with a meaning. That's what people define it as. But this parable was a bit different. It was almost an allegory. Now, if you don't know what an allegory is, perhaps some of the younger people will, they know all about figures of speech. An allegory is a story in which every detail represents something in real life. Not just one, but everything in the story has a meaning. If you don't know what an allegory is, maybe you have read Animal Farm by George Orwell. That was a famous allegory. Maybe you've, hopefully you have, read Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. That was another allegory. And this is what Jesus said. A man planted a vineyard. That's how he began the story. Simple. A man planted a vineyard. Let's leave it there, it's nice. A man planted a vineyard. This would immediately remind his hearers of Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. In Isaiah, this is what the prophet wrote. I will sing for the one I love, a song about my, at his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up, cleared it of stones, planted it with the choicest vines. <coughs> he built a watchtower, cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. That's Old Testament. <coughs> and there it was describing Israel, God's people. They're described as God's vineyard. He bought a wall around them to keep out. In the vineyard, the wall was to keep out the foxes and thieves. He dug a wine press and went to the watchtower. <coughs> the Jewish people would realise God had put a wall of protection around them very often and was ever alert to see any danger they were in. But of course the purpose of a vineyard is to grow grapes and at harvest time to make wine. A vineyard needed to produce fruit and God was looking for his fruit from his people. What was that fruit? Good works. And if you look at this little picture here, you will see a wine press. Rather primitive in those days, wasn't it? Can you imagine it's your job to put the great bunches in here and then tread them underfoot? They put ropes up the top there so they could get more pressure on them, so they could squeeze more of the juice out into the vats. You'd have to have a, probably, if we tried it just like that, people would be torn to pieces, wouldn't they? But obviously they had been used to walking everywhere in bare feet. But they squashed the grapes, which ultimately would make wine. And I read somewhere that some people suggest that some of the best wine that you can buy, most expensive, has been treading under people's feet. Perhaps it might put you off for them drinking it. Um, it was hard work to make the juice flow into the vat to make wine. How, now, how true was the story that God had chosen his vineyard, a people who would serve him and produce the fruits of good works and worship him. And we're told that after this man had built this vineyard, you can leave the picture now, <coughs> he decided he had to go away somewhere for a long period of time, so he rented out this vineyard to tenants. Presumably, there was a, they had to pay a rent. The rent was going to be part of the produce. Now these tenants, who were they in this allegory? 
Well, the tenants who were meant to lead God's people were clearly the religious leaders of Israel. The priests, the elders, the Pharisees. These people were meant to lead the people in God's ways. Their responsibility was to ensure God received good fruit from his people, which was pure worship, gratitude, faithfulness. Hmm. Well, harvest time came. So the owner was going to collect his share of the vineyard fruit or wine. We don't know what percentage it would be, 10%, 20%, doesn't really matter. But what happened was, of course, in this story, you notice, the tenants took the person who came to get the rent, the wine, they seized him, it says, and beat him, and sent him away empty. Then the owner then sent another. He was struck on the head, treated shamefully. Then the owner sent another one. They killed him. And he says, then he says he sent others. Some they beat and some they killed. Well, if this is an allegory. God is sending people to his people to ask for their loyalty, their worship, their praise. Who are the servants who got sent to the people to get the people to worship him <coughs> over them? Well, they were clearly the Old Testament prophets, weren't they? If you think of some of them, think of Elijah. He had a great battle with the false prophets. And after that, he had triumphed there. The queen at the time, Jezebel, said, I'm going to ensure his head's not left on his shoulders tomorrow, until before tomorrow morning. She didn't achieve that, but that was her idea. She was going to deal with him. She didn't like being told what God wanted. She wanted to worship false gods. You think of Jeremiah, he was put in a pit. Other prophets, Jonah, Daniel, but the latest of all, of course, was John the Baptist, wasn't it? He was a prophet sent by God to call the people to repentance. But what happened to him? Well, if you look back to when we were looking at, I think Mark 6 or 7, whatever it was, his head was chopped off. Sent one, sent another, sent another, and they all got mistreated. God's servants, God's prophets, were undoubtedly nearly all mistreated by the people who would not listen to their message. And then we get to the crux of the story. He had only one left to send. A son whom he loved. He sent all his other servants. No respect. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. Well, would they? The tenants saw the son coming and they said, Hey, look, he is the heir. <coughs> Let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. So what did they do? They took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Now at that point, the story moves to prophecy. What's going to happen? He's told us all what happened to the prophets. And now he says, the tenants see the sun coming. Let's kill him. So they killed him. Threw him out of the vineyard. God, the owner, sent his son and they killed him. While well, Jesus spoke those words on Tuesday of Holy Week. And of course you remember he was killed by these people on the Friday of that week. So 
So Jesus basically is prophesying the fact of what is going to happen to him within a few days. And then Jesus looks ahead in the story. Now, what will the owner of the vineyard do? The owner, of course, is God. He will come, Jesus said, and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And you see, these wicked tenants were the corrupt religious leaders who did not seek to teach the people to follow God's ways. Many of them were more concerned in making money. There's quite an interesting part of the story and history. In AD 70, that was probably around about 35 or so years later, after Jesus spoke these words, the temple where he was and was teaching now was completely destroyed by the Romans. Hardly <coughs> stone left on another. There were no more sacrifices offered then. The priesthood was killed and scattered. They no longer had any influence over God's people. What did Jesus say? They will be destroyed and he will give the vineyard to others. Well, I think this means that the vineyard became the Christian church. <coughs> and the apostles and teachers were the new tenants to teach the people what God required of them. So part of this is a story looking back, but part of it is talking about what's happening in the future. In fact, he had prophesied earlier that the temple would be destroyed. But those people who were seeking to kill him, to destroy him, were destroyed themselves. And they no longer had any authority, position over God's people. It seems to be the teachers apostles were the new tenants. And Jesus said these words, have you never read the scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Well, the stone the builders rejected was, of course, Jesus. They wouldn't have him. They wanted to throw him out. They wanted to kill him. Has become the cornerstone. And the cornerstone of what? The cornerstone of building of the church. That's a, a quote from Psalm 118 and I think it's one of the quotes that appears most often in the New Testament. Several times that that's quoted in Acts, in 1 Peter. Um, the stone the building of the church has become the cornerstone. That was Jesus. Now the capstone, the keystone of the new building that God was building the church. Well, what was the reaction of the priests to hear this story? Now, it's obviously they knew that this story was aimed at them. They understood every bit of it. They knew what it was all about. What was their reaction? Chief priests, teachers of the law, elders looked for a way to arrest him. Because they knew he'd spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him and went away. Oh, they would have longed to have lynched him and killed him right away, but that would have caused a riot. The Roman armies would have come in. You see, they knew that Jesus spoke the parable against them. They were scared of the crowd. They didn't arrest him then, but they were looking for an opportunity to arrest him and kill him. Which is ultimately what they managed to do. But of course, as you know, the cornerstone of Jesus did not stay there. He became a person preached about in Acts, and even on the day of Pentecost, we were reminded that God's cornerstone was Jesus. Jesus an amazing storyteller. And see, on the, just, the end of that question, just coming with this 
wonderful parable which basically told them the history of Israel and what was happening around them at that time. I'm going to come around the community <coughs> table in a moment. Before we do, we're going to sing the first two verses of 263. Then when Phil has <coughs> led us in the communion, uh, we will sing the final three verses at the end. Uh, it's two, it's when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain and account of loss and all contempt on all my pride. Let's sing this lovely hymn. The first two verses. <coughs> church was forgetting the purpose of what the Lord's Supper was. So the explanation is this. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. It's quite clear, isn't it, the purpose of the communion is a time for us to remember the Lord Jesus. It's also important, isn't it, for each one of us to examine ourselves and to say, are we Christian people? Have we accepted the true message of the Lord Jesus Christ? And are we trying to live as Jesus wants us to live? Believing in him and putting our future with him. 
Because if we do that, then he forgives us all the things that we do wrong. And there's plenty of those, isn't there? We begin to know we can try and write them all down. But what a, a saviour we have. He's the only way, isn't he, for us to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he's preparing a place for us. And that's what we're remembering this morning. What the true purpose of Jesus is. And it tells us, didn't it, that he broke the bread. And then having broken the bread, take a piece, and then when everyone has some, then we will take it together. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Let's just remember this morning the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for us. Then remember, don't we, the, that sacrifice involved the shedding of his blood. It was an awful way to go, really, a crucifixion, one of the cruelest ways that anyone could lose, lose their lives. Right? But he did that willingly to you and I this morning. And that's what we're called to remember incredible sacrifice through just taking the wine. Let's remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, sacrificed for us and for our future. We we'll take up our hymn books again and on the screen, and we'll sing the last uh, three verses. See from his head, his hands, his feet. Just that love that he has for each one of us.
It demands that we accept the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he blesses us. And he's left us with his Holy Spirit. That through the Holy Spirit that we may be encouraged. But we thank Jesus this morning for his amazing sacrifice for us. It demands our love for Jesus. May the Lord be with you as you leave today. May we have fellowship together in the name of Jesus.